This message is brought to you by North Ringwood Uniting Church, a God-focused, grace-filled community helping you grow. We hope you enjoy. So the Bible reading for tonight is from John chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. Jesus heals a man born blind. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Let's pray to open the service. Heavenly Father, we just pray that as I speak tonight, I speak your words. That anything that I say that isn't of you um, would be stripped from people's minds immediately. Thank you for this church and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word together. I thank you for each person here tonight as well. pray these things in your name. Amen. So good evening everyone, welcome to week three in our Image of God series. Now so far in this series we've seen that God made us all in his image, that all of us are made to image and represent and bring glory to God, which was challenging this ancient idea that only kings and pharaohs were made in the image of God. And then last week Andy showed us how what we think of others, like how we view what they, who they are and what rights they have, that determines how we treat them. And This week, we're going to go into slightly a different direction. We're going to look at the image of God and disabilities and health issues. So to start with, I want you all just to take a few moments to think of people in your life, people who you know who have some sort of disability or health issue. It could be a physical disability. It could be an intellectual or a mental health um, issue. It might be autism or Down syndrome, it might be depression or spina bifida or blindness, or it might be any number of rare and unpronounceable conditions. And you might be thinking of yourself. You might struggle with something that causes you some sort of disability. And so I want you to have these people or have yourself in the forefront of your mind throughout this message. Now, who here has seen this film or read the book? Hugh was the one who put his hands up. That wasn't what I was expecting. All right. (laughs) Okay. Now, it's called Me Before You. It came out, I think, last year. Um, And I must admit, I haven't seen it either. I was tempted to watch it, but I'm like, there's limits to what I'll do for this service, and that wasn't one of the limits that I'd go to. But I followed the controversy that went on around it. And the basic plot summary is this, that there's this guy who is a successful banker, And he was in a motorcycle accident which left him paralysed and in a wheelchair. And he starts to get cared for by Khaleesi, um, by this girl here named Lou in the film. And he reveals to her that he plans to end his life in six months' time because for him, a life being disabled isn't a life worth living. And the view presented by the book in, uh, in the movie is that the best way that this guy's carer and his family and everyone else can get on with their lives is if he is no longer in the picture. So you can probably see where the controversy came from. Because this movie is supposed to be an uplifting, romantic movie. But to me, it's indicative of a deeper problem that exists inside our society. And it's tied to how we tend to put values on people, and especially people with disabilities. And so that's why we're doing this series. We're contrasting how the world sees people with how God sees people. And one of the reasons that I like the Bible so much is that it doesn't pretend that tough things don't happen in the world. It doesn't pretend that life is all rosy and easy. It actually speaks into these issues like blindness, like disabilities, like pain. So we're going to dig into this story, Jesus and his disciples' interaction with this blind man. And I'm going to pull three main points from it that we can apply to ourselves and to our lives. And I'll put them up on the screen as we go. Point number one. Jesus calls us to see people with disabilities. Now, how does this story start? The story doesn't start with the disciples' questions or with the disciples even seeing the man. The story starts with Jesus seeing the man. As he, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. It starts with Jesus seeing the man. And so I would start by encouraging us all, children, young people, adults, We need to see people with disabilities. And what do I mean by that? Well, I don't mean see them, like the priest and the Levite on the Jericho Road in the story of the Good Samaritan who saw the person in trouble and then passed on the other side because that's our natural reflex, to see and to avoid, but we are not natural people. We are followers of Jesus and we have the Spirit of God in our hearts. And so we should see people the way that Jesus sees people. 
which begs the question, well, how does Jesus see people then? Well, in our world, I think we tend to judge people based on what they can or can't do. And if you don't believe me, think of people like sports people. We lift up so highly those who are good at sports and value them above others. And we do the same thing with celebrities and models. They're beautiful people, so we treat them differently. And most of the time, it isn't even a conscious thing. It's just something that's so ingrained into us. We see what people can do or how they look or how popular they are, and we want that. We see them and we move towards them. And this means that naturally we move away from people who don't have that. We avoid the loner. We avoid the person with problems. That's our natural response. But the Bible speaks directly into this. And the Bible is full of stories about Jesus seeing and moving towards people that others have rejected, others people are moving away from. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, lepers. These people are absolutely shunned by the people of their time, because that was their identity. That person is a leper. That person is, a, is their disease. Like, that's their identity. That's how we're going to define them. That's what the world was saying. And we still do it today. I've spoken to tons of people who are struggling with something like cancer who hate that that's all that people see them as now, the person with cancer that the thing that's disabling them is now what people identify them as. When they're shouting, I'm so much more than what is disabling me. I'm more than my cancer. I'm more than my disease. I am a person. And what they're asking for is what Jesus is doing with the blind man here. Jesus is seeing the man first and then the disability. Not the disabilities, then the man. See, Jesus sees people at a deeper level than what they can and can't do. Jesus sees them made in the image of God and of infinite worth and value. So those of you who struggle with something that disables you, I'm sure you would love people to see you that way too. And so if you want to be one of the most remarkable kinds of people in the world, like a Jesus kind of human being, then you can be one by seeing people with disabilities, by seeing them and moving towards them, not out of pity, but out of love, because that's what Jesus does. And so that's the first point that we get from this, that we need to see people with disabilities. And the second point that we get from this story is that Jesus gets us to move away from cause and towards purpose. And I'll explain that. See, the disciples have failed point one. They've seen the disabilities in the man, not the man in the disabilities. They've seen the blindness, not the person. And so they ask Jesus this question, likely within earshot of the guy, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Now, I think we'd all agree that that's probably not the kindest words to say in the moment. But Jesus redeems this moment as he redeems all our moments when we don't say the right thing. Because what are the disciples asking? They're asking, what is the cause of this blindness? And they've narrowed it down to one of two possibilities. Either this person sinned or his parents sinned. Is this blindness a punishment for the parents' sin? or a punishment for his own sin? And you might think that this is a primitive question, that we evolve beyond asking questions like this, like we don't think this way today. But just think, the Hindu idea of karma is built off this way of thinking, that how you are now, that your lot in this life is directly determined by well, what you've done. You get what you deserved. So that's what the disciples are asking. Did he sin? And do you ever think this way too? Like, Something bad happens to you. You might be struggling with something and you focus on the cause. You try to work out, why has this happened to me? What did I do? Well, I know I sometimes think that way. And Jesus says, in effect, that specific sins in the past don't always correlate with specific suffering in the present. In verse 3, Jesus answered, neither this, man sin neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, Jesus is saying that the decisive explanation for this blindness is not found by looking for its cause, but by looking for its purpose. And think back to week one in the series, if you can. We talked about how every single human being has been made in the image of God and in some way reflects God's character and goodness. And that is what Jesus is saying here, that the works of God are displayed through this man born blind. The works of God are displayed through people with disabilities. God uses all people to display his works where they are at. And God can use you to display his works where you're at. See, Jesus is saying we need to move away from the cause, away from thinking about the cause, and look towards God's purpose, knowing that there is one. 
And so what happens to this man? Well, he gets healed of his blindness and starts to be able to see. Now, a lot of people think that the works of God being displayed through this man is healing his physical blindness. And healing is one way that God can display his works through his people, but it isn't the only way. There's nothing that says that it has to be healing for God's works to be displayed. Like think of other examples in the Bible. When Paul cried out three times for the thorn in his flesh to be healed, (coughs) Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus is saying, I'll put my power on display not by healing you, but by sustaining you. In other words, healing displays the works of God in John chapter 9 in this man born blind. And sustaining grace displays the works of God in Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. And what does this all mean? It means that you can and you definitely should pray for God to heal your friends who have disabilities. That you can and you should definitely pray for God to heal you if you have a health issue that causes you suffering. And as a church, we believe that Jesus is alive and can heal people with disabilities. But do not make the mistake of thinking that the only way that God can be glorified through people with disabilities is them being healed. There were lots of other blind people and sick and disabled people in Jesus' time who he could have healed but he didn't. So instead, I would encourage you to look for how God is glorified through the person where they're at. Now, there's this fa- fairly famous Australian guy called Nick Vujicic. I probably pronounced his name wrong. And he was born with a condition called tetraamelia, meaning he has no arms and legs. And he's a Christian. He goes around giving motivational speeches to schools and churches. Now, I've got a six-minute video here where he talks about finding how God can be glorified through his disability, this idea of moving away from focusing on cause and looking towards purpose. So let's watch that. Uh, anyone on the sound desk? Yeah, man. I want you to know that the fear of being alone and having no purpose in your life is one of the most disabling things that you'll ever experience in your life. And you need to know the answer of two questions. Who are you and what do you want? For me, I realized as a kid, yeah, there was a choice I had to make. Either believe what the world said and only believe that broken pieces are ahead for me or believe that God loves me. It was hard. Because when God says in the Bible, I have a plan for you, I'm thinking, really? And I prayed for arms and legs. What do you want? I wanted arms and legs. It's not that difficult to believe. The God of the Bible says he has a plan for you. Do you see this timeline? I'm eight years old going forwards into the future. No idea what was ahead. The Bible says he has a plan. We don't see the plan, so it's kind of foolish to believe something that you can't see. But faith helps you to do that. Faith is exactly that. And faith comes when you hear the Word of God. When I heard the Word of God, I still didn't understand His love, His plan. So I prayed for a blueprint of His plan. And He didn't come back to me on that request. And when you don't hear from God, you then start to conclude what you believe. From then on, do you decide to keep on Believing and waiting to see what happens and trust Him? Or do we conclude to do this? There is no God. I'm alone. There is no hope. There is no purpose. I'm getting bullied for the rest of my life. I'm never getting married. I'm never going to have kids. Never going to be happy. Man, was I wrong or what? And at age 10, I tried to end my life, but I'm still here. All I could see were broken pieces, and I had no idea that there would ever be hope for someone truly disabled. Emotionally, mentally, uh, uh, spiritually, physically, the whole thing. I mean, on every checkbox, 
I wasn't myself sometimes. I was so angry, angry at my life. And I want you to know in your life, there will be times where you feel like you'll be on the edge. But when you look at the word disabled, D-I-S-A-B-L-E-D, when you turn your back on the lies like this, and you come to the truth, the truth will set you free. Do I look disabled to you today? No. When you put a G-O, go, walk by faith and not by sight, and you put a G-O in front of the word disabled, it spells God is able to do what? Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask, imagine, or attain. What does that mean? It actually means that God has a good plan. He never withholds any good gifts. I was 15 years old and I read John chapter 9. A man was born blind and no one knew why. Jesus was asked by everyone, why was this man born blind? Now, my doctors don't know why I was born this way. My parents don't know why I was born this way. And I want you to know that we don't have any answers for my birth defect. Jesus said this blind man was born this way because God's works are going to be revealed through him. Jesus spits on the dirt, puts mud on the face of the blind man, and there is no record of the blind man saying anything, flinching, asking anything, moving backward, nothing. Jesus performs his miracle as he is still. I realized Jesus did not sit the blind man down and say, "Uh, Mr. Blind Man, my name is JC. I'm the healer. I'm about to spit in the dirt and give you a facial. And after we wipe the mud off your face, you're going to see. He didn't do that. God doesn't need to tell me His plan. I just need to be still and believe He has a plan. That's when you walk by faith. Why would you need faith if God told you everything? If I was age 8 and I prayed for arms and legs and God instead told me everything He's going to do until the age of 33, you got to be kidding me. I would die of shock. Writing books, 55 languages. If God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then who can God not use? Amen. He loves you and he can do anything with your broken pieces. based on what they can or can't do, but instead start looking at people based on what God can do through them. And that leads me to my final point, that Jesus heals the disability in all of us. Now, it might sound cheesy, but the whole point of this story in the Bible is to contrast physical blindness with spiritual blindness. Now, I'm going to run quickly through the rest of John chapter 9, because what happens is this man is given his sight by Jesus and then pulled before the Pharisees. He's pulled before the religious leaders, and they accuse Jesus of being a sinner and not from God. And the man replies his famous words, whether or not he is a sinner, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. But the Pharisees, they double down. They hurl insults at him and say, You are this fellow's disciple. We are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. So these Pharisees are blind to who Jesus is, and they kick this man out of the synagogue. 
And Jesus hears that the man has been kicked out of his religious community and he finds him. He's once again moving towards the marginalized. And he asks him if he believes in the Son of Man. And the man, the man replies, well, who is he? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus responds, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Now when Jesus says, now you have seen him or you have now seen him, I don't think he's just saying physically with your eyes. He's saying spiritually, your eyes have been opened. And Jesus says that this is really the reason why he came into the world. Regardless of our physical ability to see All of us need Jesus to heal us spiritually so that we can see him for who he truly is. That is the number one disability that Jesus came to overcome and it's the one that we all have and that we all share together. I was reading a vision statement for a disability ministry that exists in a church in America and this is what they say is part of their vision statement. We want our lives to reflect an unshakable joy in the Lord that allows us to embrace a life of suffering and disability for his purpose and glory. We want to shout that life with a disability and with Jesus is infinitely better than a healthy body without him. We say with Paul that this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We want this to be true as individuals in the church and in the church as a body. And I love that line. We want to shout that a life with a disability and with Jesus is infinitely better than a healthy body without him. And I think this is why I resonate so deeply with the controversy around the Me Before You film. Do you know what the promotional tagline was for that film? Live boldly. And do you know what all the disability rights groups were saying that the underlying message towards people with disabilities was? Die quietly. Me Before Euthanasia trended on Twitter. See, I would rather see people with disabilities through the lens of Jesus, all made in the image of God and of infinite worth and all reflecting God through who they are than through the narrative of the world that life is only worth living if you're normal. So what about you? How do you see yourself as well? Put the three main points back up on the screen again. Let me read through them just quickly. Point number one was that Jesus calls us to see people with disabilities, not just look at them, but see them and love them. See them through the eyes of God for who God sees them as, made in his image and likeness. Don't avoid them, don't neglect them. Move towards them like Jesus does. Point number two was that Jesus gets us to move away from cause and towards purpose, that our default position should be looking for how God is displaying his works through all people, not getting hung up on how something happened, but focused on how God is going to reveal himself through it. God is able. And those are two great points, but here's the thing. The only way you can do points one and two, the only way you can see people through the eyes of Jesus and look towards trusting in God's purpose is if you live point three. See, seeing people through the eyes of Jesus means allowing Jesus to open your eyes to see disability in yourself, that you can't save yourself and that you need Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. Only then can you truly see those with disabilities, brothers and sisters made in the image of God. And only then can you truly see yourself through the eyes of Jesus, that we are all made in the image of God, everyone is made in the image of God. And that is something to be celebrated because that is our identity. That truth over our lives will always be greater than any disability we or someone else might be going through. Made in my image is how God sees us. How do you see others? In the beginning... In the beginning. In the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. The first day. God said that there'd be light. And he knew that it was good. The second day. God made the space sky. The third day. God named the dry land earth. 
Then God said, Let the earth grow plants and fruit trees. The fourth day, God made two great life to rule the day and night. He also made the stars. The fifth day, God created many living things in the sea and every kind of bird that flies in the air. The sixth day, God made every kind of animal and all the small growing things. Then God said, Now let's make humans who will be like us. So God created humans in his own image. God created humans in his own image. In his own um, image. In his own image. He created them just like himself. God blessed them. God looked at everything he had made. He saw. And everything was very good. God created me. God created me. God created me in his own image. God created me. In his own image. God created me in his own image. Amen.